the world needs more renewable energy. And I guess in my mind, the question is, why don't we have even more of it? And the answer is, it's, we are doing really, really well. You know, four or five percent of the world's electricity is provided now by solar. If you asked me a decade ago, I'll tell you that just about 0.1% of the world's electricity is provided by solar. Solar has been increasing year after year at about 20% overall rate. I mean, if my bank account was jumping at a 20% interest rate, I'd be doing really happily, right? But that is what solar is doing, is growing at that astronomically fast rate, and yet it's not quite fast enough. We need to cover roughly the area comparable to all the roads of United States with solar cells. That's what we need for the planet to be indeed energy collecting in a renewable fashion way. That's hard to do. It's hard to do because actually solar cells is not what cost in the overall installation of the solar field. It's the installation process itself. That's what costs. If I can make installation simpler, I can make a dramatic change in how rapidly we can deploy the next set of solar cells. And so we looked at what would make solar installation simpler. And the answer very simply is weight. Get rid of the weight of the solar cell. A typical worker uh, in a, uh, by law in a construction site is not meant to be picking in repetitive fashion anything heavier than 50 pounds. Otherwise, they can get hurt. So if they're not going to be lifting anything heavier than 50 pounds, my solar panel cannot be bigger, heavier than 50 pounds. That's the weight of one by two meter panels of solar cells today. And that's because we use four millimeter thick piece of glass and a chunk of silicon that's very thin, but very fragile. And they need a four millimeter thick piece of glass so that the, if the glass bends, well, the glass can't bend if it's that thick and consequently silicon, silicon wafer will not crack. If you do try going three millimeters, your silicon wafers are likely to crack, so it develops so called micro cracks. So I need four millimeter by two meter squared area of glass. That's 50 pounds. If I can get rid of that piece of glass, I can make a much more valuable technology. I can't get rid of that piece of glass unless I get rid of silicon. So let me use something else. And so what we started using is organic tin films, perovskite tin films, and asking questions, is it possible to make an extremely lightweight cell? The answer is you can. You can make them extremely light. And you can make them on plastic. Mm, you lose some weight, but not too much. You can make them just floating on their own. Ah, now they become too fragile. You can rip them very easily. What if we can just add them, those extremely lightweight cells, on top of a fa fabric, on top of a substrate that will not break? Fabric was our choice because you don't rip your shirts very often, and co and the vacancies between the threads of the shirt give you the lightweightedness. So, you can make fully printed, large area, transferable photovoltaics on fabric. These are, when you finalize them, they weigh 100 grams per meter squared. So two meters squared would be 200 grams compared to 25 kilos for a conventional cell. So we're talking about a factor of 100 less weight per meter squared. Final structure of the thickness uh, is about 50 microns. Your hair is 100 microns in thickness. We are thinner than a strand of human hair when we finalize this structure. Is it rippable? Actually, it's not. The fabric we're going to use is a fabric that is utilizing bulletproof vests, kind of like Kevlar. It's called Dyneema. Uh, it's a fabric that is extremely strong. When a ship got stuck on the banks of the Suez Canal, they did not use steel cables to pull it off the bank. They used Dyneema-made cables because they were lighter and stronger than steel. So let me make a fabric out of it and put on top of it our solar cell. And you're going to get yourself an extremely lightweight technology. This particular technology is driven very much by, can I give you a format for rapid deployment? 
but can I also give you a more economical technology? Because at the end of the day, I can give you the best solution unless it makes you money, you're not gonna spend money installing it. Not to say you're making a bad choice by not installing my expensive solar cells, you're making a right choice economically. You're not trying to save the planet, but is it your job to save the planet, right? I mean, you can say back at me. So my goal would be to both make you economical sense as well as <laughs> technological sense. So we gone ahead and uh, did a, a one quick, uh, you know, weekend back in 2017. I had, uh, I was hanging out with my high school, uh, one of my kids who was in high school and I asked her, you know, can you help me figure out the prices of all of the most sold vehicles in the United States? It sounds like a ridiculous thing, but you know, I, I had an idea behind it. So I said, you know, can you, uh, can you, you know, if you give me Toyota Camry, uh, you know, it comes in different models, you know, the gold-plated one and the one that's basic. The basic one is what truly costs, right? The gold-plated ones are all fluff. So give me the basic model price. And since you're looking up the price, just also give me the weight of the vehicle. And let's make a plot of, since I know how many vehicles were sold of Toyota Camry versus Honda Accord versus Ford 150 truck, let's make a plot of what's the volume of sales and what's the price per kilo of the vehicle. Every data point here shows you one vehicle. And notice it's a semi-log plot. Um, so let's ignore these guys. Those are extremely small volume sales. The moment you get rid of the extremely small volume sales, every car in the United States that you buy costs the same per kilo. Hmm. <laughs> really? <laughs> I, I showed this to Chris Canital, who actually kind of help, advises companies about how to set the price of a vehicle. <laughs> and I'm like, I can help you. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, it's, it's a, I, I was stunned by it. I mean, I was surprised by it. I'm like, you know, is this, does this hold off in other markets? And the answer is, I, I'm not an economist. What the heck do I know about economics? But I'm curious about these things, right? I'm looking around to find, is there an underlying reason why things cost the way they do? So I'm like, well, I don't have the data for the other items in the world as detailed as I have the data for the cars. But I can look, let's say, the, for the most sold models of washing machines on Amazon or refrigerators on Amazon. How do I know what's most sold? I don't. But I can look at like highly rated ones, the ones that have like many comments. So a whole, whole bunch of people must have bought them. So let me go ahead and show you very much non-statistically valid set of data, meaning I haven't done the same kind of let's look at every vehicle sold. And uh, this is what you find. Um, yeah, 80% of the vehicle weight produced is in this chunk. Um, on the left are the basic commodities like foods, starting materials. Yeah, they're from like a dollar to a few dollars, depending what starting material you buy. And over here on the right is the finalized items flat panel TVs, cars, AA batteries, bicycles, air conditioners, refrigerators. Notice that everything you buy in Walmart or Target is somewhere between five and $20 a kilo. I don't know why. I think it has to do with the number of synthetic steps you choose. Those of you who are chemists, we've done this study once ago. Once ago. We've gone ahead and tried to figure out if I'm trying to make the following chemical, how much should I charge for it? What's the cost of making the following chemical? And the answer is very simply, how many synthetic steps do you take? That actually was very powerful because I needed to know how much money can I spend on an active layer of a solar cell in order to meet the particular price point for solar electricity. And what that taught us is that if you go beyond three synthetic steps, you are, your chemicals will cost way too much to make them economically viable in a solar cell. So give me a very simple synthetic process and I'll give you something that I can sell at a low cost to the consumers. It's kind of like saying, you know, if I'm, I don't know, if I'm making a Jimmy Dean sausage, I needed to start with grain and then I needed to feed it to a pig and then I needed to, you know, slaughter the pig and sell the pig. And that every step 
not the best example. <laughs> um, if every step of the way, I need it to invest in the next in synthesis of going, or you know, start with a, a tree, cut it down. After you cut it down, make it into planks. After you make it into planks, lay it into a structure, uh, make a wall, build a house, right? Every one of the things you've ever done takes synthetic steps to get there. Give me a few as possible and you'll get myself a point. The thing that I can take out of this is the conventional silicon panels are about five bucks a kilo today. If I can maintain my lightweight cells to also be five bucks a kilo because of the processing steps I'm going through, and I'm giving you 100 times less weight per panel, I'm really reducing the cost of electricity by a factor of 100 if I'm at the same efficiency. I'm not at the same efficiency. My cells are half as efficient. I'm still reducing the cost of electricity 50-fold. That can make a difference. <laughs> that can make a technology that truly can be transformational. That is the motivation for building the lightweight cells. And if you're extreme about, as I am now becoming, on looking at these numbers, I, I asked a very simple question of what would be the cost of MIT Nano per kilo? So um, it turns out that uh, MIT Nano is about 14 bucks a kilo. <laughs> This is not the premium that you pay to the builders and such. This is, you know, cost of materials uh, to actually build it. There's a little couple extra bucks for the premium of actually building it. Um, make it way less, it will cost less. That's one way to look at it. Why do cars stop at six, 14, 16 dollars now per kilo? I don't know, but I'll tell you that the buying power of a typical worker in U.S. has not changed since 1980s. And as a result, there's only so much of your salary you can spend on a vehicle. And as a result, don't give me a gold-plated doorknobs as a standard, because that's an extra synthetic step I can't afford. So minimize it. Cars in India cost about $5 a kilo. But you would never ride them on US roads, because they don't have airbags, they don't have safety belts. They're minimized. Synthetic steps were stopped before you can get, if you give it to a consumer because it's acceptable to that consumer base uh, to take it that way, not for us. If you do the same plot for Ford Mustang from 1970s through today, you'll find it always cost 16 bucks a kilo in prorated dollars, <laughs> just saying. So uh, the randomness of these choices that I just made you, that kind of the guidance on how to think about the next technology Displays are not about an image of the display. Display value was in the flatness of the display. The value of the solar cells is not in the efficiency of the solar cells, although mind you, give me as high efficiency as you can. I think the value of the solar cells is in the light weightedness of the solar cells. That's what's gonna bring down the cost. I might be wrong, but if you look at the solar cells installed on a Jimmy Carter's White House, they look exactly the same as the solar cells we use today. We have not changed the format for the last 50 years. <laughs> format is what's killing the cost. <laughs> format is what's making the cost so high. So let's figure out how to change the format in the process. The um, other thing one can imagine is making a solar cell that is invisible. And this is another startup called Ubiquitous Energy that got formed. Using molecules, you can optimize the absorption bands and you can make the absorption in the visible part of a spectrum diminish down to nearly zero, while the infrared absorption and the UV absorption still exists. So you can make a solar cell that you can look through and the open circuit voltage of the series connection of a whole bunch of the little cells here added up to 106 volts under sun shining on, onto it. So you can make very high efficiency cells that are imperceptible by simply making the trick of nanomaterials giving you the optimized absorption spectra. Ubiquitous Energy took that and uh, made cells like this. This is a piece of glass, and if you attach electrodes to it, uh, make sure there's a motor at the end of those, shine some infrared light, and you're gonna get yourself electricity out of that piece of glass. 
an extremely powerful technology that can re make you rethink where you will find your energy source. Of course, if you stop the infrared light from shining on it, the electricity stops. So is it uh, that your glasses from now on have a way to generate a few milliwatts of power so they can power your hearing aids or your Bluetooth radio? Is it that your Kindle can now have an electronic surface that recharges it in a room light in a course of five days or the outside light in the course of 30 minutes? Or is it your whole skyscraper has windows that 20%, 25% of the electricity of the skyscraper is now covered by the windows? Those would be very different ways of thinking of what energy can be provided by, by rethinking what the solar cell looks like and labeling it not a solar cell, but an active surface that happens to advance itself through the nanostructure of the material itself. So uh, the active surfaces, uh, the, the work that Ubiquitous Energy has done to make these active surface, uh, you know, to make a truly transparent structure, they've done a, one quick analysis and estimated, well, what if in the 1980s, when the low E glass started being adapted, what if instead we adapted Ubiquitous Energy's electricity generating surface? How much gigatons of CO2 would we offset using these PVs? About two gigatons of CO2 would have been offset today if this is what we started doing back in 1980s. That's a huge impact that could be done by simply adding an extra layer on what already is a coated piece of glass. Installation doesn't cost you anything because you need a window. Making of it, minimal. You're, just add, you're not even using a piece of glass to make your cell. You're using someone else's glass. All you're adding is a micron of material in three or four layers thick. Very different way of thinking of what technology can be.